All right, hey guys, how's it going? I am joined here by Eva Putseva. I don't know if I'm getting that correct, but um, uh, running for the House of Representatives in Arizona in District 01. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining. Um, you guys reached out to me after a couple of interviews I did, and I understand that you're running against an incumbent in Arizona, Tom O'Halloran, if I'm getting that name correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I figured we'd chat for a little bit about, I guess, your campaign, what you guys stand for, what you're doing, what you're trying to do, and what you hope to accomplish if you win. Absolutely. Uh, so starting out, what, um, where would you put yourself, like, politically in, in terms of, uh, like, establishment Democrat standard, you know, ver versus more, like, progressive <laughs> versus, like, Rose Caucus left? Like, what do you kind of see yourself fitting in on the political spectrum there? So I became a U.S. citizen in 2007, and the day... After I became a U.S. citizen, I uh, registered to vote, and I registered to vote as a Democrat, and not just Democrat with a capital D, but a Democrat with a lowercase d. And to me, that is that means that you know anybody who supports equality, justice, peace, democracy. Um, I didn't grow up in this country. Uh, I grew up in. Uh, Slovakia, the former Czechoslovakia, and I was 12 in 1999. So obviously that transition from a totalitarian regime to democracy formed my uh, political views and my opinion. And I uh, experienced uh, when I was a teenager, you know, growing up in a country that um, had that maintained some of the basic uh, protections for people uh, like universal health care, like um, fully publicly funded pre-K through college education. And so those are the things that, you know, I benefited personally greatly from. And I believe that uh, Americans uh, would benefit greatly from too. And while we are trying to box people in these various uh, boxes, um, you know, I do, when I ex introduce myself, I often say I'm a progressive Democrat, but just for as a shortcut so people understand that I support universal health care, that I support uh, getting rid of uh, the burden of college debt for all the young people and older people who are uh, trying to get a college education. And I, I want to see a complete immigration overhaul. And I don't believe that perpetuating these wars of choice that we've been perpetuating for decades is... Uh, making us um, safe and in fact is draining resources that we now definitely see we absolutely need to invest in this country so that's a very long answer sure. to sure. Um, short question so I, I i don't think i fit neatly into a, a box yeah, <laughs> because of yeah. of because of where i come from okay what um you said you got like your official citizenship was done in 2007 I became a U.S. citizen in May of 2007. What, what like instigated you into running for Congress now? Like why in 2020? Like, was there like a specific thing or? Yeah. So the very first time when I thought about running for Congress was actually in 2012, and I was helping uh, Venona Benali Baldenegro, uh, a Dine woman who was running in this district for Congress. And the reason why I was helping her, because I realized that after 2008, uh, the, the corporations or the corporate world uh, was bailed out, the economy uh, so-called recovered, and yet people didn't see the benefits of that recovery. In fact, the inequality uh, grew. And so I thought I would, you know, I, I was contemplating running <laughs> for Congress, uh, in the next cycle, but uh, I talked to other people and the people suggested as, you know, they often suggest, oh, you should run for a lower office. So I did, I ran for um, uh, the office in um, Flagstaff for a local city council seat mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I got elected and one and the major agenda item that I um, proposed uh, that I would fight for was a living wage. And I did that because I, that I wanted to make a difference, if not nationally, then at least at the local level in the area where I saw um, we were not making progress. That means, you know, more people live in poverty, 
and you know the middle class is shrinking and people of color and women and all the marginalized communities don't seem to be getting ahead so i took that step and i served four years on the city council um to run for congress um, is you know requires a lot of preparation and planning um, to have a chance uh, it's important that you know you know what you're doing and uh, you your life your everything you know in your um, immediate um, circle is set up for success and so um, in 2018 I was still on city council and there was no way to both run a congressional campaign and um, be serving on the local council. So this is really the first time and I felt like I had the opportunity. And it wasn't just, obviously, if we had a great representative, uh, I would never probably consider running for Congress mm -hmm. because there's many other way to be uh, productive and to contribute to the community and to make progress. Uh, but how, but by 2018, I saw that not enough is happening, not just in this district, but really in the country. And, and that's why I decided um, in 2018 that I would be um, running um, for Congress. Sure. Uh, so I'll, I'll have questions about like your differing opinions between you and um, Tom, Tom mm -hmm. O'Halloran, right? I think is his name. Um, I just kind of curious because everybody always has ideas about, you know, like if I get into Congress or the city council, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And then it seems like when you get there, you know, it's like, okay, hold on. This is a little bit harder than I thought. Did you have any like uh, conceptions going into the city council for like ambitions or things that you had? And then once you got there, you realized it was a lot more difficult to effect, you know, the type of change you're looking for. Like, were there any big lessons learned there after spending four years on the city council? Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the um, I mean, I knew that, you know, you're one of seven on the city council and in Congress, you're one of 435 people. Mm -hmm. And to get anything done, obviously you need a majority to be on your side. And uh, um, you know, some, but that being said, um, the the big lesson I guess is that you know you have to to some degree decide what you're going to prioritize, and that is a difficult decision because you know time, energy, political capital, all that is limited, and so while we can you know walk and chew gum at the same time and we can work on multiple things there are also things that uh, you know you will not be able to uh, address and some things that you know you have to really understand how the that particular level of government works to n know that uh, you know what kind of strategy may work and so so there are there, there's that lesson that i know no matter where, um, there are things that I will probably have to put on a back burner and, and, and not prioritize in order to get other things done, right? Yeah, of course. And, and, and that comes with great cost because to some people, what you're putting on a back burner is the most important thing. And that's why you, you, you know, you, you hear this oftentimes politicians saying it's like, well, you cannot make everybody happy, mm -hmm. uh, but that's not, uh, why we elect, um, representatives, you know, we look for leadership and again, it's imperfect because it's a representative <laughs> democracy. Yeah. So people give you mandate, uh, to do what, um, you present to them. Uh, presumably during the campaign. Uh, and so my big priorities uh, certainly uh, are uh, big, you know, climate action um, and the kind of climate action that goes hand in hand with uh, retooling economy and uh, bringing economic prosperity to the underserved communities. So it's not either or, but end end. Um, kind of solution, which I think the Green New Deal offers to us. And through that Green New Deal uh, policy framework, 
we can, especially in this district, start addressing uh, that lacking infrastructure uh, that the native communities uh, have been uh, impacted by. And so, so, so this is kind of a, you know, it's a big, uh, um, I guess, goal, mm -hmm. but I think we have to address uh, issues like running water, electricity, and pave the roads uh, for the native communities. And we can do it through the Green New Deal. Um, because that's exactly what is envisioned under that proposal. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, so another issue is healthcare. Uh, we see it today that when we couple access to healthcare with employment, we end up uh, with in situations where people may like their health insurance, but they forget that that health insurance is there only as long as their employer offers it. Yeah. And once they lose that employment or their spouse loses that employment, uh, there goes uh, their access to healthcare. And so we need to address uh, healthcare. I think we need universal healthcare. I, I do support Medicare for all. And so, you know, obviously we know what the reality is. We have Congress right now, Democrats uh, are um, in power in the House, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, and, and, and then there is a small group of progressives who are, who were successful in uh, starting the conversation about these big issues. And so what we need to do is strengthen uh, that voice. Um, that is really voice that, in my opinion, reflects what the population uh, at large wants, because that's what I hear from people. Mm -hmm. Being um, so, being in Arizona, that, that is like, to my understanding, Arizona is very purple. Um, I think you have one Democrat senator, one Republican senator, and then your house is like split like five four between Democrats and Republicans right now. Do, do That's you, correct, which is, which is amazing when you think yeah. about it. People, people don't think, people think about Arizona as being a red state, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, out of nine seats, five are Currently held by Democrats. That's a big deal. Yeah. Do you ever feel like, um, I, I'm only asking because I have Republican parents. Um, do you ever feel like you face like an uphill battle sometimes because of um, because of like where you're from or your accent? Do you ever ever have people accuse you of of weird things of like you not belonging or especially being like in a more purpley area where appealing to moderates or maybe more central people um, is important? Is that ever a problem for you that you have to work on? Well, well I definitely you know face um, negativity. I mean, xenophobia is. Uh, um, doing well in this country as mm -hmm. everybody knows yeah and, and you know when i was on the city council uh people had no problem um being uh, incredibly disrespectful to me because of my accent mm -hmm. um but, but you know you you learn to live with that and um you know it's uh, something that will always be with me i didn't start learning english until i was uh, 15 years old, so I will have uh, accent for the rest of my life. Um, you know, the, the brain, uh, those connections when it comes to uh, languages, uh, they they change, and you know, after certain age, you just can't uh, pick up the language in a way um, you would pick it up if you are learning as a child in a truly bilingual environment. Sure. And so, so that's, that's a disadvantage, but it's not something that people should assume just because uh, I have accent and maybe uh, sometimes I don't say something perfectly grammatically correct that it any way, shape or form affects my thinking or my ability to be strategic because it has nothing to do um, with that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it is uh, something that uh, that's uh, part of me. Um, I something I cannot change. I don't think uh, it's necessary uh, obstacle challenge that uh, I cannot uh, overcome. And uh, plenty of people can see, you know, through these um, kind of superficial, uh, I guess, 
perceptions. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I mean, I, of course, it's stupid. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to say you should judge people based on accents. But um, I wonder, especially like in a more like if you were in like a super blue area, I imagine it wouldn't matter as much. But in the mm-hmm. in the swing areas, you know, especially early when you bring up political capital, um, there are so many concessions that have to be made and so many considerations that have to be made for other people that uh, it, it sucks that just having an accent might be like part of an uphill battle, you know, in certain races. Yeah. And it's and it's very important to to understand that you have, you have to also think uh, you know different accents uh, have different impacts on people. I mean, for fifty years, um, this country demonized uh, you know the Eastern Bloc countries, and so people with uh, a Slavic accent um, have disadvantage because there is still this. Uh, notion that you know we all are just communists Mm -hmm. (laughs) and uh that's something that's real it it is you know the fact that when somebody has accent and comes from mexico you know people don't uh consider that accent uh it's not sexy accent for americans the way you know french or british accents are so there is definitely a hierarchy of accents and i think we have to all work very hard to make sure that we uh, don't uh, assume or don't make assumptions mm-hmm. based on accents. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, of course I agree 100%. Um, when it comes to Tom, what are your big problems with, I guess, how he's run for his time in Congress? Like, what are some big positions that he has that you disagree with, where you think that he's maybe made some missteps on? Like, what, what's like the big separator? So I'm a Democrat in Arizona. I'm going to be voting um, on my representative. I want a Democrat that's effective in office, that represents, mm-hmm. you know, maybe progressive values. Why are you a more effective choice than Tom? Well, um, he was a Republican all his life, mm-hmm. which, you know, hopefully it uh, reflected his values. Uh, in 2016, he ran in this district as a Democrat. Then he voted 54% of the time with Trump. And uh, these, you know, votes were not just um, innocent votes, but their votes, for example, to deregulate banks. He was, he joined with Republicans to weaken the Dodd-Frank Act that was put in place after 2008, when uh, large banks were uh, prevented from engaging in uh, some risky uh, transactions behavior that actually put uh, the entire country's economic uh, system at risk. Uh, He actually voted to uh, reauthorize a warrantless spying program um, as part of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you talk to conservatives, if you talk to independents, I don't know what um, private citizens actually want to be, uh, you know, under that kind of surveillance. And I think that's a big problem. So this is not, we're not talking here just, you know, Democrats versus Republicans. We're talking here about uh, influence of uh, big military industrial complex, influence of big pharmaceutical and health insurance companies, because those are the companies he takes money from. Uh, He also uh, voted with um, Republicans to criminalize immigrants. And, you know, he voted for this uh, act called uh, Kate's Law. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so there's, there's number of votes, you know, he, he doesn't support, uh, or he voted against, uh, taxing carbon. Taxing so, what? Say that again. Carbon, carbon. Oh, 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 carbon tax. Okay. Gotcha. So, so when I, I think no matter what the issue is, he is siding with Republicans when it's, um, important. Last summer, he was one of only seven Democrats who voted for a failed amendment that would give Trump the authority to go to war with Iran 
without congressional approval. So again, you know, he, he changed parties, but he didn't change his values. Mm -hmm. Do you think and there's so, an art? Or sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and so I'm running as a Democrat, as a real Democrat. Mm -hmm. do, do you think there's an argument to be made about, um, so earlier you talked about like uh, prioritizing certain issues. Um, mm -hmm. do, do you think that Tom would make the argument that he had to backseat certain issues or he had to give certain votes on some issues in order to maintain his position on, um, uh, oh man, I looked up earlier. I think, so like he, he talked about having harder stances on, I think it was like gun legislation. Um, oh man, and there's something else related to Trump. I've got it written in my notes here. But, but I know that there are a couple of things that he falls to the left on. Um, do, do you think that he would make the argument that he needed to wheel and deal a little bit more um, and that's why he, you know, he, he did vote in the way that he did for whether it was Dodd-Frank or anything else like carbon taxes. Well, that, that can be the excuse, mm -hmm. but that's not, uh, I mean, you know, we can, you can rationalize and you can come up with excuses why you vote certain way. But uh, uh, what was he running on? Mm -hmm. What was the platform running on other than he was a Democrat? There, there was nothing. So, you know, I think we have a problem when we, elect um, representatives. I mean, people should run for offices. I think there is a reason why we have election every two years. And, uh, um, you know, it is not welcome for people to run uh, for congressional seats that are occupied uh, by the, the specific party. Challengers are not viewed positively, but we should see it as a positive sign, especially those challengers who offer uh, an agenda. Mm -hmm. Because then you know that if 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 people want to see that agenda succeed and will support that um, candidate, then that candidate has a mandate to vote the way that would improve or you know whatever they feel they they you know they they need to do, and so. I don't know what kind of excuse he had for deregulating big banks. Mm -hmm. To me, the, you know what the excuse, the, the reason why he's voting like that is because he takes money from these uh, corporate interests, private prison industry. Why does he want to put more people for longer in jail if, if it wasn't to benefit the prison industrial complex? When he takes money, his campaign gets contributions from private prison industry, from mm -hmm. health insurance companies, from banks, from from every entity, from fossil fuel industry, right? Yeah. So you cannot say that he is voting just like as he can say that he's voting because he thinks that this is a real, truly represent the district. I can say he votes like that because he is bought. I, so I noticed on your site that you list that you guys don't take any type of like corporate or PAC or super PAC money or anything. Yeah. Um, the, so, so some of these are hard. I'm sorry that this is always, this has been like a central point of like this election season is like, um, do we take corporate money? Do we don't, I think the justice Dems just recently flipped their stance on that. Um, and, and, you know, like Elizabeth Warren was talking like, oh, when I run, you know, I don't take any money now, but in the general, I will. There's been a lot of different like talks about what's an appropriate amount of, corporate or PAC money or super PAC money to take versus not. If you were in a situation in your district where it seemed like it just wasn't possible to raise enough money, like if you were being outspent like five to one or 10 to one by your opponent, do you think that there's an argument there where it's like, okay, um, maybe I make a few legislative concessions to a certain group in exchange, you know, for their support um, so that I have a chance of winning the election? Or do you think it's better to run on principle? And if you don't win, you don't win and you try harder next election season? What, um, what are your thoughts on that? It's a really hard one. Sorry. Um, no, it's not a hard one. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, every, every, every candidate has to make the decision for themselves. Mm -hmm. I am a candidate. It would not take, uh, uh, corporate PAC money, I think taking, um, you know, this is the big problem in uh, uh, Congress. And again, uh, whether you are uh, conservative or liberal or anything in between, uh, people do recognize that uh, corruption, uh, institutionalized and legalized corruption in our political system 
is the biggest problem that we have. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I would, I wouldn't be me running any other campaign. And uh, it's very easy decision to make. It's incredibly makes, uh, you know, we have to work uh, very, very hard to uh, put together the kind of budget that makes us, um, makes our campaign uh, viable and competitive. Mm-hmm. And I understand okay. that, but uh, I just wouldn't do it any other way. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's fair, I guess. Yeah. Um, you, you, so you've mentioned a, a lot of the policy positions that you have outlined on your site already. You mentioned healthcare, you mentioned the Green New Deal, immigration, um, the Native American issue. I, I'm, my, my understanding is that Arizona has like a pretty special relationship with um, like Native Americans or reservations that are listed. Um, well, this district specifically, the Arizona's first district uh, has the largest Native American population of any district in the country. So 25% mm-hmm. per- People who live in this district are Native Americans. Um, there are 13 different tribes in the district, um, and you know the, the unique challenges that people who live, let's say, on the Navajo Nation, are challenges that other people don't realize uh, that people deal with. You know, 30 percent of people uh, on the Navajo Nation don't have running water. Uh, even though transmission lines uh, go by their homes uh, to power Phoenix, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, many people don't have electricity. You know, hundreds of miles of roads are unpaved. All these conditions um, make it much harder for people to live the kind of life that actually they do want to live. Mm-hmm. And, and then we have to, and they're not, you know, this is not uh, accidentally like this. It's because we intentionally didn't prioritize uh, these kind of infrastructure needs. And we have to change that and we have to prioritize it. And um, that's what I feel we have to do uh, to co- start correcting the wrongs that we have done as a country, as a federal government toward um, the first people. Why do you think there's been so much pushback um, uh, against like getting, I guess, reservation lands, the, the types of help it needs? And, and what do you think are like the big roadblocks um, preventing the type of assistance from being delivered? Like why, I, I know that there are certain issues that we talk about all the time in the US and it seems like um, reservation land is one of those issues that gets brought up a lot. What do you think are some of like the big roadblocks that are keeping that from happening? Mm-hmm. It, it, it is just, um, political unwillingness to Mm -hmm. invest a large amount of money into something that's been neglected uh, for way too long. You know, we, um, as a country, uh, even during Obama's administration and Trump's administration continues uh, the same policy of uh, pumping, uh, I think it's $1.3 trillion into modernizing uh, our country's nuclear arsenal, well, that $1.3 trillion should go to the native communities to fix their roads, bring water to them, and to bring electricity to them, mm-hmm. um, and, and probably more. And so it is a matter of priorities. It is what uh, we uh, want to do, really. Uh, it's uh, We just don't want. We, as you know, and I mean our political elites, uh, don't want to spend money on the native communities and similarly on other uh, you know, black brown communities uh, elsewhere uh, in a country and we just have to do it mm-hmm. I think there is no, no easy way it's going to t- cost uh, tons of money and we still have to do it because that's the right thing sure uh, you mentioned earlier that <clears throat> sometimes you have to put certain big political proposals kind of on the back burner to focus on, you know, like one or two really big changes. Unfortunately, we can't pass our entire agenda uh, every new Congress. What are your like one or two like really big, like if I go to Congress and legislation is penned, I want my name to be on this bill. I want my name to be included in this. What are like the, the like the one or two really big things that you feel the strongest about? So, so we already had You know, some of these uh, big bills have been introduced and I will be enthusiastically supportive of those uh, bills. And that's uh, the Green New Deal, uh, Medicare for All. I uh, 
and again, you know, that Green New Deal to me has a huge connection to uh, the indigenous territories and how we can actually build their infrastructure through that. Um, in addition to these two big um, agenda items, uh, I also want to see a complete immigration overhaul. And we need uh, a comprehensive bill that's going to address many, um, uh, many aspects of our immigration system. Um, I don't know if you know it, but before 2003, immigration agencies were under the US Department of Justice. In 2003, they were moved under the newly created Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. That is a big problem and we need to bring it back to the U uh, U.S. Department of Justice. I think we do have to create an immigration oversight uh, committee that is going to actually deal with all the um, complex uh, immigration um, elements. You know, we do have to expand uh, the, uh, the, the Refugee uh, Act. Um, this, excuse me, this act to cover individuals who are fleeing uh, climate disasters or who are fleeing um, violence of any kind. Uh, we have to normalize the status of those who are in this country without documents. That includes um, people with uh, DACA, DAPA, and TPS. And we have to remember that even under Republican um, presidencies. We have done in the past just that. Um, and my understanding was that even Bush was going to normalize the status of millions and millions of people who are to this day living in the shadows of our society uh, before 9-11 hit. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that uh, uh, we have to uh, shift our priorities and, and uh, spending uh, to case processing. Uh, in, in immigration, we've been prioritizing enforcement. And I think it's time and we know that, the, that ICE lost its moral authority because of just, um, you know, how cruel uh, their approach has been to, you know, in separating families, uh, we have to end this uh, practice of uh, detention mm -hmm. in immigration system. There is no reason why we have to do things uh, the way we are doing. Sure. And so that's a big, 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 big set of uh, reforms that I absolutely want to be leading, be part of, and um, champion. Sure. Um, if any of these are ever too personal, you can always tell me you're not comfortable saying or whatever. Um, I have a fiance that lives in Sweden. So as a result of everything we've been doing, I've kind of seen firsthand how funny some of the immigration stuff is. Um, like if you visit the U.S. from a European country, sometimes they'll let you in, sometimes they won't. There's no real rhyme or reason. Like it's just like random decisions made <laughs> when you basically fly in, um, assuming you haven't like broken a law or anything. Uh, you did the whole, I'm not entirely sure if it was via marriage or, or how you immigrated here, but you, you did the whole green card process so that you're a citizen. Uh, do you have any like personal, like firsthand, either positive or negative experiences with kind of immigrating here that give you some insight into the whole system where you're like, wow, I can't believe how crazy this was or, or something related to that? Yeah. So obviously, you know, every immigration story is different and yet all are in some way the same. Mm -hmm. You know, people, I think, oftentimes don't realize that you know, the only way you can uh, have a permanent residency in this country is if you can adjust your status from some other legal status. And the problem is a lot of people do not have a legal status. So there is no way to adjust uh it from two right because there's nothing <laughs> to adjust it from mm -hmm. um i when i was uh, going through um you know this was before 2003 at the time was immigration and naturalization services and i just i just saw how differently people were treated based on the color of their skin and um 
based on proficiency of uh, you know they had in uh, English, mm-hmm. which I find very uh, bothering. And this is like this you know when we talk about you know racism, xenophobia in this country, you know we we have to teach people, and so they understand that when somebody speaks another language. They, they speak another language. And then, you know, English is maybe their second language. And d- depending on where they are uh, in learning that language, uh, maybe they're not uh, as good uh, in it. But what I found interesting was just how disrespectfully were people treated, people who were uh, brown and black, you know, people who were coming from, uh, Central America from Mexico. This was in uh, Phoenix. Mm-hmm. I, I just was surprised uh, how disparate treatment uh, I, as a white woman, received and they, as brown people, received. Another thing to realize is that while there are, you know, the, the process is, you know, clearly written up and there are forms and all that, at the end, you are at the mercy of that officer who is dealing with your case. So, yeah. for example, yeah. I had my, um, uh, my my partner at the time was supposed to bring um, was supposed to bring a birth certificate or passport to demonstrate that he is um, an American citizen, mm-hmm. and you cannot get American passport right unless you get unless you have birth certificate. Mm-hmm. Like you have to right first when you're applying for passport so so it makes sense so the, the it was clearly stated bring um, your uh, american passport or birth certificate and we got to the um office and the officer said i want both i want this and this and what could you say it's like oh thank you okay we'll come we'll come next time we'll bring both yeah yeah, and, my and lawyer for our case is like, he's got like, there's like 400 different things and he's like, just make sure you have that and that and that and that and that just to be safe, make sure you have this. There's like so many documents. Yeah, it's pretty and, insane. And, and, yeah, and if the sentence says this or this, forget, don't, don't assume that the officer uh, thinks about the logic of the language mm-hmm. and be on the safe side. Um, but, you know, so I, I was uh, obviously, I didn't use any legal help i mean you know it, it, it was expensive because every single time you have to pay a few hundred dollars yeah. and in fact the the fee went up uh, astronomically mm-hmm. since uh, i went through the process and the time is but, crazy too like if you go to a meeting and you don't have the right piece of paper or whatever like sometimes the next like appointment is a month later and that's it's it can be so much time oh. and it's like trying to plan out like where you live if you don't have the money to stay wherever or people to stay with yeah it could be a nightmare yeah. too and so you know our big problem is that you know if, if we believe that there are 10 million people without documents there is part of this population that just missed some deadline that perhaps didn't have money to pay for a particular form mm-hmm. and they kind of miss uh that you know step on the pathway which is very narrow to get you to permanent residency mm-hmm. uh, and ultimately to citizenship yeah i've yeah. also heard in no uncertain terms that like I know that for my fiance, if you come through immigration, like as long as you're like pretty white girl, like you're fine. And for the most part, it seems like she comes through. She doesn't get asked any questions. I think she was here for like eight out of the last 12 months of the year. I mean, technically, like they can let you in, but they should ask questions, but they just don't. They don't even care, which like blows both of our minds every time she comes through. But um, yeah, it seems really brutal. And then you hear about people like Arpeo in Arizona, you know, that pull people over because they look too brown yeah. and ask for, yeah, certification. Like, are you- Native Americans. Let's not forget, I have friends here in town. He's an he's activist. He is a fantastic human being. Um, and every single time he goes through the um, airport, he's being pulled over. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he is on some kind of um, list that you know that the U.S. government maintains, and he is American citizen. So let's not, you know, it is very troubling. I think where we are as a country, and it's troubling to me because I do know what are the signs of where your country 
uh, is starting uh, looking starts looking like a totalitarian uh, regime in some aspects. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we should be very careful uh, about that. If we as people really believe in freedom and democracy, and if you don't think about these terms just casually, then we have to think about how our lives, even in the last 20 years since 9-11, how they've changed. Mm -hmm. And what everything is being, you know, the data that's being collected about us, how's data being used, how's data being used by corporations and how corporations then collaborate with uh, government, what government has access to about uh, all of us. Uh, and we cannot just say, well, that's okay, I didn't do anything, that's fine, they can have it. Um, there's always opportunity for uh, abuse and corruption, and we have to be on the lookout for that. Sure. Yeah, I definitely agree. Do you have any opinions about like I, I'm? I can kind of guess what they probably would do, but like people talk about like making English like the national language. Do you have any opinions about that, or do you care? Or... Uh, I just. I mean, I don't know why English would be a national language in this country when we have, you know, we, you have uh, five hundred different tribes that you know have their own uh, language, and that's their first language, and that language has been part of this land long before English was uh, spoken. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing with, um, you know, people who speak Spanish. I think it's actually a great thing about the United States that you don't have a national language. Um, obviously, you know, you are greatly disadvantaged if uh, you are not fluent in English. Um, it is something that, uh, you know, our structure systems uh, definitely make it harder for you to be successful in this world. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't see even practical reason what would that, who would that be benefit and how would that benefit the society if English was the official language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing that you um, mentioned earlier, you talked about immigration reform a lot in terms of making it easier for certain groups to, to immigrate to the United States. Uh, my understanding is that southern states tend to bear kind of the brunt of, of like large numbers of people immigrating. Um, and I know Arizona has obviously been in the news for a, a lot of immigration related stuff as well. How do you uh, how, how do you talk to like native Arizonians or, or I don't know if that's what you guys call yourselves native people from Arizona? How, how do you um, like quell their problems if, you know, they're worried? Well, hold on. You want to do all this stuff to make it easier for people to immigrate. Um, you know, well, now we're going to have to be the ones that, you know, watch our towns and cities change or deal with a high number of immigrants that maybe threaten local jobs. Um, what do you say to kind of balance or alleviate their concerns? Mm -hmm. So this country, for most part, we, you know, and this is kind of from selfish, um, um, American perspective, we do need immigrants because we actually don't have enough workers. Mm -hmm. The reality mm -hmm. is then, uh, you know, right now we are in the recession. So we are, uh, you know, we are seeing people losing their jobs, but, um, for, uh, most of the time, uh, we actually don't have enough people, uh, working, um, in, um, all kinds of sectors, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we mm -hmm. have special work programs uh, for whole industries right bringing people in to work in those industries so i don't think that uh, the idea that they're going to take your job um, is uh, i mean i'm sure it's used politically but it's not based in uh, any uh, fact or you know reality i do think you know there is uh, obviously that sentiment and this is you know we have to be clear that this is not a uniquely american sentiment uh that uh distrust of others and distrust of people who speak different language eat different food uh look differently that that is something that people around the country you know europeans are not you know less they're not better in this um and so so i think what happens is though when people interact with uh and i'm just you know saying in quotes others you know mm -hmm. immigrants or you know it can be native americans are oftentimes uh, perceived as others in their own country right but yeah. once you yeah. get to know people who are other than you um 
you understand that they are the same kind of human as you are. And so I, what I've learned is that people who have the most problems with the others are the people who interact with them least. And um, in Slovakia, where I grew up, so in a, you know, there's the, there's a lot of people have distrust. They don't like Hungarians, especially if they come from the northern part. You know that that nationalistic kind of movement that we see here. It's uh, you know exists everywhere, and uh, and and they don't even you know interact with the people on day to day basis because they're not close to the border. Um, and so I I hope that. Um, we as people can uh, recognize the good that's in all of us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, somebody coming from Mexico or Central America, you know, they're just as wonderful human beings as uh, the person who was born in Arizona or Nebraska. Um, you know, we have all dreams. We all want to have meaning in our lives. Um, so I think to be um, a little more generous to those who maybe we don't know yet um, would go a long way. Um, and I don't mean generous in terms of money. I mean generous in the terms of spirit and in, in, in being welcoming. Yeah, and, accepting people. You know, in, in our policies, the way we, um, you know, treat them. Do you? This is kind of a. This might be a hard one. Do you think that like the fall of the Soviet Union uh, and growing up like in that environment, do, do you think that shades your views of politics at all? Um, not in terms of like love or hate America or anything like that, but just in terms of like giving you a different outlook on political systems or how people uh, protest or demand change or what like changing regimes look like or, or anything like that. How does that influence the way that you see like politics today in America? I, I think it completely formed me as a political human being. You know, you cannot. I was twelve years old in nineteen eighty nine, and uh, so I was old enough to also to understand uh, how the totalitarian one party regime operated, and old enough to uh, kind of witness, absorb, and be part of that uh, Velvet Revolution, and then understand. Uh, the transformation and the transition and the the, the pain and the, and the you know the different kinds of corruption that um, uh, followed and so you know that to me that that's why when, when you said like wherever do you fall in this spectrum is that's a diffi difficult um, to I think maybe understand from American perspective because I understand that you can have corruption from the left and you can have a corruption from the right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a way, the way the one party totalitarian regime operated is n no different than a big, than from how a big corporation operates, right? Sure. You it benefits very few on the very top who have control and can set the rules. Um, and, uh, you know, the rest, uh, don't see, uh, the gains, right. And so it can be exploited and you can use ideology to just like manipulate masses, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, growing up in Slovakia, we used to, there used to be a saying, uh, they pretend to pay us, we pretend to work, right. So that's kind of tells you what was just wrong with the society, right. It's, it's kind of, um, and, and and so I do have a more nuanced um, perspective on you know when people like I don't call myself socialist I uh, I am a social democrat you know to to me uh, that more precisely describes the kind of uh, society uh, I appreciate you know we in uh, 1989 we. Uh, very peacefully. I mean, people, it was an uprising, right? It was a peaceful uprising. Uh, you know, when I see um, police, um, you know, these days, um, uh, you know, encountering uh, protesters, and I think about the way um, the 1989 happened, it's, 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 it's so chilling, because uh, while there was 
some violence, like it kind of started from some uh, suppression of protest, essentially. Um, then eventually um, the enforcement stepped back. And, uh, but the difference was that there were millions and millions, I guess, million people. I mean, like, obviously the country is much smaller yeah. in, in yeah. the trees. So, you know, proportionally, it would be as if all of us, you know, everybody who joins a women's march and, you know, that kind of crowd and goes on, goes out to the streets every day for an extended period of time, not like once a year, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's influence how I think about things. And, um, and, and that's why I you know, see myself as a social democrat. I understand the value of these basic programs that can create a sense of security when it comes to healthcare and education. So you know that the, these basics are taken care of and you don't have to live in a constant stress because I think this is what is people don't realize that Americans live in a constant stress of not having health care, if they get sick, then, you know, $100,000 bill and it will wipe out all the equity you built in your home. Lifetime, if you yeah. are lucky to own a home. Uh, people in other developed countries don't live in this constant economic stress. Mm -hmm. So I, I spend, my time is all spent online. That's where my existence is and that's what I see. So I see a different, a very different political world sometimes than, than what's seen like on the ground um, in different countries or in different states. Um, do, do you see a rise of like actual like socialist types in, in the U.S. like in your eyes? Does that happen or is this like only like an online thing? It seems like it's generally online. Um, well, I, you know, I see, I see the label is being used a mm -hmm. lot, but I don't, you know, like, um, you it's know, more just Republicans saying anytime you talk about government spending, you're a socialist, like that right, kind of thing. Right. Like to me, that is like, well, you can, you can label me and you can use whatever label you want, but, mm -hmm. but if, you know, the, to the, the way, you know, when I think about socialism and, you know, we have to understand we have never seen, you know, successfully apply the uh, I ideals of socialism, and we have not seen successfully apply the ideals of democracy and even capitalism in in a terms the, um, the the kind of uh, market purists like to talk about because we don't have. Uh, a, a real market system. This is like a patchwork of monopolies and, mm -hmm. you know, giant mm -hmm. corporations uh, owning uh, essentially, you know, few corporations owning everything, right? Yeah. So we don't have a true competitive market either. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, yeah, you know, I, I think it's, um, but what I see behind all of it is like if we kind of step away a little bit from those labels, what I see is a desire of people to uh, get some um, basic uh, safety that allows them to live a decent life with dignity without that constant fear of um, what if I get sick, I don't have a health insurance, uh, what if I lose a job, uh, what if I don't get a job when I graduate and how I'm going to pay the bills. Like a, it's, it's just you know, Americans live very complex lives, economic lives, right? There is not very a lot of security. Our jobs, for most part, in most states, uh, employer can fire for any reason at all, mm -hmm. right? There are no uh, protections. Uh, the the balance of power is, um, you know, so uh, tilted towards the advantage of the corporate corporate world then I think what we see is this desire of people to kind of balance that uh, power a little bit more. So we don't have to live in, in this constant fear and constant stress. I mean, I've, I mean, how many people you probably heard or know that are dealing with depression, mental issues? Well, that's a reflection of the anxiety that people encounter every day. Um, 
So, I, you know, so it, yeah, I see the label, but I think the, the labels, the labels are used kind of like we, we're fed up, you know, we want change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people cling to that label a little too much and it's just becoming, you know, sure, yeah, I understand. Online, uh, phenomenon of, you know, who, who greater socialist, you know, wow. and, and all that. And to me, but that's not for, I think most people, you know, sure. like, that's not, you know, we're not talking about, uh, pri about um, uh, seizing uh, whole sectors of industries and, and, you know, getting rid of private business. Sure. Yeah, some, yeah, for the most part, I'd agree, yeah. Um, I'm just curious, did you go to school um, for, like, political science or anything in, in English? No, I, I have actually a master's from the University of Economics in Bratislava, and so it was a five-year program, uh -huh. and I ended up, um, you know, the last two years is kind of your major focus, and uh, that was commerce and marketing. Gotcha. Was the, um, was the, was it, was this the institution, was it in English or no? No, it's Slavic. Oh, okay. Yeah. You, you use a lot of like English terms, like patchwork of systems or political capital that I don't usually hear like foreign speakers use because it's, it's like you. I've been you here know. for 20 years. So I yeah. actually never, you know, it's very interesting because I've, I, I've never worked in mm -hmm. Slovakia. I actually don't have my language. I don't have professional language in uh, kind of slovak environment yeah. yeah no it's really good like usually um usually it's really hard for like foreign language people to pick up like those kinds of like phrases because they're not or at least as far as i understand it, a lot of people don't it's really hard to learn like a lot of the higher level terms so you do it's a really good job at that i was just curious if you actually went to school um in like an english school for some of the topics so yeah nice um uh we're, we're coming to the end here um i've got your website uh linked for your uh, for your political run, um, is there any like um, coming away from everything? Uh, if you could leave somebody with like a two minute impression of what it is that you kind of stand for, what it is that you're running for, what um like yeah, what, what would that sales pitch be? If you have like two minutes to somebody's door to like persuade them to vote for you or anything? Well, we we, we have to really um, work on. The democracy in this country and really you know i i understand how um people want to live meaningful lives mm -hmm. and uh, what i want to change is not something we can change uh incrementally because uh we've tried that and uh, and that doesn't bring uh, people of this country uh the kind of sense of uh, stability and the prospect of prosperity. And we do have to address some of these giant challenges that are, um, you know, are difficult to comprehend because we human live, uh, you know, let's say hundred years. And when we talk about climate change, climate is something that changes over a long period of time, mm -hmm. but we have to, invest in retooling our economy and we have to do it in a way that's uh, just and equitable and i want to be part of that i don't operate from a position of fear um, you cannot buy me and i think we need uh, more courageous representatives we need leaders who are and who understand just how critical, uh, how, at what critical uh, crossroad we are. There's actually a great um, old Greek saying that goes something like this. Um, a society advances when old people are planting trees, knowing they will be not sitting in their shades. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that's kind of the metaphor where we need to be, you know, in terms of, and, and not just in terms of, um, you know, climate, but those trees, that's a metaphor for healthcare. We, we need the older generations to understand where that younger gen, what younger generation uh, faces. And we need a lot of that intergenerational uh, cooperation so we can uh, have uh, a better country, uh, more inclusive, healthy, and just society. Okay, cool. Okay, cool.
Um, I wish you the best of luck. I have your uh, donation stuff listed on the um, website so everybody can see it. Um, it's evaforcongress.com. Um, I understand you've got a Twitter account as well. Do you, you use any other social media besides that? Yeah, so uh, the Twitter account is at Eva Kutsova, and then on Facebook, uh, Eva for Congress, and then Instagram, I think it's Eva for Congress as well. Um, super easy to find. And um, I hope uh, everybody's going to join us. I would love to get your support. Um, and uh, Eva for Congress.com, you'll find a way to volunteer. Uh, with us and you'll find a way to contribute to our campaign to help us succeed awesome i wish you guys the best of luck when is your uh when is the do you have an open primary or is it so so uh, our primary it's a uh, semi-close i guess it's a democratic party primary but independents can vote in the primary if they request mm -hmm. uh, ballots to vote in that democratic party primary and it's on august 4th However, in Arizona, early voting starts on July 8th, which is, um, I think, 37 days away. Uh, so the time is ticking, and um, every little help uh, would be greatly, greatly appreciated. All right, awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Good luck for you guys. Um, and yeah, I wish you guys all the best. Thanks a lot for coming Thank on and chatting. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me. You are ecstatic no, to watch America let you Did right now. That? Yeah, you're like, oh, we Did can't I do anything that? better. Like, you sound like a, like, you sound so pathetic. How you, how you look at your.